So, uh, so amazing to see how many people here. You know, historically, this is the lowest Sunday by far, pretty much for the whole year after the Sunday after Christmas. And so it's so awesome to see all of y'all coming back here to gather together to uh, worship God, to be encouraged by God, and just continue to grow stronger as we kind of go into the new year. And as, as Nate was saying earlier on, uh, for the last four years, this is kind of what we've done. Um, you know, every year, uh, we kind of have a big idea. We have, a, we have something that we really want to work on as a church family. And so uh, throughout the whole year, all of our sermon series are different series, but there's, there's a, a thread that kind of goes through it. Like last year, uh, we, our thread was make the most of what you've been given. It's one of our culture statements here. It comes from uh, something that Peter uh, wrote uh, in his second letter. And, um, and so last year, we were just talk about what are the things that God has given us when we give our life to Christ that helps us just to, if we leveraged it and made the most of them, it would change our lives. Like God gave us a gift of prayer. If we actually talked to God, man, that would really change our lives. God has given us this beautiful gift called scripture. What if we made the most of scripture? Man, it would be amazing. If you've given your life to Christ and the spirit of God is in you, what if you made the most of the Holy Spirit in you? That'd be amazing. And what if you made the most out of every, you know, every single day of the gift that you've been given of eternal life? That every day you can say, you know what? Two things are for certain today. Number one, I am loved by God. There's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. And number two, I'm eternal. So no matter what happens to me, I'm good. Imagine if every single day you made the most of it, it would change your life. So we did that last year. The first year we did this was four years ago. And we had been, you know, just praying about it and praying about it. And, you know, you know we do this, um, you know, months before. Uh, and in, in, in 2019, we're just, you know, praying and thinking, you know what? I just feel like this in, you know, 2020, Lord, that this year is going to be in a crazy year. And so the Lord just kind of put it upon us. This is kind of say, okay, you know what? The big thing for 2020 is going to be, it's going to be okay. Little did we know what we were going to go through. But by God's grace, we, walk, we were able to walk through that all through 2020 by which to help us to realize that God is in control no matter what's going on, even though the world seems like it's out of control. And we see that was four years ago, right? Well, this year, um, last summer, we've been praying about what, we, you know, where we should go as a church family in the year 2024. And, and it just kept coming back over and over and over. And the staff just kind of, you know, reaffirmed it is um, we decided that we're going to kind of work on two of our culture statements here at River Run. And there are culture statements that kind of go and fuse together. They're a little bit different, but they're kind of the same. Uh, one of those culture statements, you may have heard it, God takes strangers and makes them family. And the other one that we talk about here is moving closer to God moves you closer to others. That actually God's big vision is to, is to bring back people into a family as him as a father, as a firstborn, Jesus Christ as a son or older brother and us as kids together that we're family. And um, not only that, but moving closer to God does not make you an isolationist. Moving closer to God, actually, the spirit will move you closer to other people through reconciliation in some ways, through just encouragement or loving somebody. That's just what he does. And we just recognize, too, that this year is going to have its own challenges. 2024 is, is going to be challenging. I mean, we're going to, we all know that we're going to have a very challenging election coming up. Um, there's a lot just going on just even in our own culture by which you can kind of feel the tension of that. Um, but even before that, one of the things that has always been in my heart of just kind of seeing how things have changed, especially in our culture, is... The, <clears throat> the 21st century church is a church that needs to be a people that grow stronger together. Back in the 80s and the 90s and even the first 2000, church was mostly programmatic. It was mostly about a message in order to help individuals to connect with God and to grow stronger. But even that, we've, we've seen that individually, we don't grow stronger individually. And one of the things that we've, we've seen just that's been very anemic within the body of Christ and culture as well is this sense of community that, that actually helps each other to, to help each other to grow stronger together. And so what I want to do is I'm going to talk just a little briefly, just, you know, I'm going to go by through some of these things pretty fast because uh, we're, we're going to have a whole year to kind of chew on some of these things in very different and creative ways. And, but I want you to do is just to, you know, after I'm done is to find a table and just to introduce yourself to some people. And all you're going to do is, is ask the question, what can we do as a, as a people 
that can get better at what Pastor Tyler talked about. And that's it. Nothing, nothing big deal or anything like that, you know. Uh, but it's just a way to be able to kind of get your mind working on this idea for 2024 and also the opportunity just to meet some people um, as well. Now, one of the things about, I've learned throughout, you know, approach from Scripture is there's the right way and there's a the wrong way and an approach of God as well. One of the things I, you know, in the past that I got wrong was, you know, you sit there and maybe you've said this or you've heard somebody say this. Well, you know what? That's not my God. My God wouldn't do this. My God would do that. Not really even really asking the question, God, would you really do that? Or is that just my opinions and my thoughts about it rather than you revealing that to me? The other thing is, is like, you know, you know, thinking about God and thinking about terms of how we use God to do what we want or what we need, you know. Um, have you ever asked the question, you know, you, maybe you've said to God, God, this is what I need. But have you ever asked the question to God, God, what is it that I really need? Because one of the things I've learned throughout reading scripture is oftentimes God's paradigms are very different than the way that we think. And that's why sometimes it's, it's kind of hard to kind of catch on to it. The other thing about it that I've, I've learned as well is to allow God to be able to speak into things rather than me telling God what he needs to be doing or telling other people what I think God would want them to do. What does God say on this matter? That's why when you see this passage, like for instance here in Ephesians chapter three, um, you know, Paul writes this, you know, this, uh, he, he writes this letter to the people of, of Ephesus. And in Ephesians chapter three, verses six through seven, he says this, and this is God's plan. And I always thought that if we are God's people, should we know what God's plan is in order to know what God wants us to do? Absolutely, we should. And as a church body, our plans really should only be God's plans. We don't make new plans. We just implement um, God's old plans in a different, maybe in a different era, in a different culture. But what is God's plan? And this is God's plan, uh, Paul said. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. That is a, that is a radical statement because Jews and Gentiles were completely different individuals, different cultures. They actually didn't really like each other a whole lot. They didn't understand each other really well, but they were animosity. But what we see here is God in his good news is to bring people back into one family. Doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile, right? That they would become one. That anybody on this planet of 8 billion people who received the gift of, of, of life and eternal life in Christ Jesus, that become a children of God, we all share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. So there are certain things that all of us have in common, and those are the things that we should prioritize in our lives. Now, at the same time, we have a lot of things that are not common, which is beautiful, different cultural backgrounds, different tastes, different gifts, talents, all sorts of just different things. And those things are not threatening when we find that our commonality is Jesus himself. In fact, we can celebrate our differences in that regard. And so what we want to do as a church body is to continue to, to enjoy the differences that we have, you know, culturally, talents, tastes, things like that. But at the same time, love each other well and recognizing that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all equal before God. We are all equally loved by God, right? So both are parts of the same body. We are part of the same body. And both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Jesus Christ. All of us do. It makes us common, brings us together. And then Paul goes on in the next verse here in verse 7. He says, by God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. What is this good news? This good news is twofold. Before that, he talked about in verse 6, is this good news of, you know, the salvation and the blessings that come through that salvation to both Jews and Gentiles. But the good news is, is also the reconciliation of humanity together. One of the things that you see a breakdown in our own culture, and you see it in so many different statistics, negative statistics, is how isolated we are and how much we are at each other's throats and how, you know, we, we flip things around. We, we, we create things that are, you know, priorities in our lives that should be secondary and things that are secondary that should be priorities. And so Paul is basically saying the priorities when we get it right is the good news that we all have a common father. 
We have a common Holy Spirit in us. We have a common plan, common mission, and we have a common family. We're all part of the same family, but we're all different, and we can celebrate those differences. And so, the beautiful thing that Paul was talking about is, I get the privilege, he said, to go out and tell the world, a world that's in animosity towards each other, that God is bringing people together in a whole new, radical, cool way as a family to make them strong. And when you look through the New Testament, you see God's purpose is not only to bring people together with him as the center of that relationship, but it's through that togetherness with him in the middle of that that center of that relationship that makes us strong. All throughout the Bible, uh, you see this analogy of laying our roots deep into God, where we get our nourishment, our strength, our anchoring in God. But the other aspect of it as well is that we as a body of Christ are supposed to be trees that are all rooted in Christ, but our roots intertwine with each other, right? As this picture here, this next picture here. So look at this. You think, you talk about strength of this tree and these trees. It's huge. The fact that it's really hard to push a tree together when it is entangled with all the roots from all of this system. It makes them stronger. No matter what kind of weather happens, no matter what kind of happens, everything, these trees are good. Not only that, but you find that, that trees also share resources as well. That even if there's a drought, they're also feeding each other and they're there for each other. I believe that the strength of the early church that changed the world and changed the Roman Empire, the reason why they did that was because they had just this incredible strength of community. And we're going to talk about more of that, you know, later on this year. But it really is that group of people that encourage each other, that are there to remind each other the promises that we have in Christ, that are there for one another and pray for each other through the hard times and difficult times, by which we gain strength with one another. And that's why, like I said, our two biggest st- statements that we're going to work on this year is God takes strangers and makes them family. Um, and here's a passage that just kind of gives us an idea. It's, it's, um, you'll see it's, it says Ephesians 4 on here, but it's actually Ephesians 2. But it says this. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're no longer strangers. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. What we see is through is that God, what God does is he takes people who are strangers and they begin to become family. Again, around God himself. And so that's kind of one of the things that we want to do here at River Run. We want to be a people that slowly learns what it means to be family. Now, I'm not talking about all of us selling all of our possessions and going and buying a piece of property and, and we all have one big compound. What I am saying is that we move from complete strangers, that we're not strange to each other anymore, that we become acquaintances, we get to know each other, and we're known. And not only that, but through that and through those relationships, we begin to care for one another, by which we want to be there for one another when we go through those hard things and hard times. And so it goes on, he goes on, Paul says here in Ephesians 2, together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is who? It's Jesus Christ. The strength of a church is when Jesus is the cornerstone. I'm not the cornerstone. Our elders are on the cornerstone. The staff is in the cornerstone. None of us are the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone. We are strong when our identity is in Jesus Christ. And so we see this whole idea of God bringing people together. as Jesus as the chief cornerstone that makes the, the whole thing strong. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Paul in another place there in Ephesians says this, this will continue. This means like God's work to bring us in, you know, uh, to a place of strength and unity. This will all continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. That as a body of Christ, we come together to help each other to, with the common goal of becoming like Christ. And that we together grow in our faith and trust through our conversations, encouragement, and understanding of what God says through his word. That we together are encouraging each other to grow in in that maturity and completeness of becoming like Christ. And then when we do this, guess what happens? We will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching because we'll be strong, you know. 
that no matter what kind of crazy stuff can happen in 2024, we're good. Why? Because we're a group of people that are together. We're a group of people reminding each other we have eternal life. We're good to, together because we recognize that our nourishment is not in the nourishment of the things of this world, but the nourishment of Christ. And we keep reminding each other, encouraging each other. And as we go through hard things, we walk that out with each other as well. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. So that's what we're going to work on as this year for the first six months. In the next six months, we're going to work on this one. Moving closer to God moves you closer to people. And so let me just kind of look at this scripture here. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. It's in Romans 8, 28. Now, we all know... We all kind of know this verse, right? We know that God works all things for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. But what is the good that God is ultimately doing in our lives? Oftentimes we relate to this verse and we think of it in terms of, you know, uh, you know getting a better job or getting our kids to act better or whatever or something to that in nature. But in the very next verse, we see what is the good that God is doing. This is the good that God is doing in the next verse in verse 29. It says, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. The goodness that God is doing in our lives is to mold us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. There's nobody who has gone through more hardship than Jesus Christ. And through all of that hardship, he went through it in a way that had inner strength, that had composure, that had peace and shalom. Because we also saw in a person who completely and utterly trusted his father and his father's plan. And so we recognize that really what God is doing is to make us like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So that Jesus would be like the older brother. He is the one that we look up to, right? And not only that, but he'd be the one, he's like the, our oldest brother, if you will, as us, as children. And so together as a family, we work together to become more like our older brother, Jesus Christ. Not only that, we also work together in order to go and show the world the love of Christ as well. So this is what we're going to be doing over the next few minutes or so, 15 minutes or so, is we're going to gather together and just find a table. It looks like there's going to be plenty of tables. You can also unhook these chairs and bring them over there as well. I don't really care. Um, <laughs> what I want you to do, though, is I know this feels weird and awkward. That's where it kind of, that's where our culture gets it hard, right? Like, you know, when somebody comes knocking on the door, what do we do? We hide. <laughs> growing, back up in, growing up in the 70s, when someone knocked on the door, guess what we did? <gasps> Sweet, someone's here. So now we've like, we're like afraid of people and stuff like that. So we as a people also need to learn to kind of how do we engage uh, into just common things with people. All you're going to do, again, no worry, you're just going to introduce yourselves around the, the circle so that people kind of get to know you a little bit. And then we're just going to ask one question. What can we do as a church body this year um, that can help us just to connect more together, to know each other better, and to grow together more as a family? You'll see that there are kind of two things to think about there. There are things that we could do, like an event, but I also don't want to just think about those things. I want to think about also, what are the small little intentional things that we can do that maybe we didn't think about, that maybe doesn't take time or resources, that could just make us connect a little bit better? So I'm going to pray. And go ahead and find a seat, and we'll kind of do that for a little while, and then I'll come back up, and then we'll transition to a time of just communion and a final worship song. So, Father, thank you for bringing us here on this last day of this year, and thank you this last day of year that um, we're here. So first and foremost, thank you for that. Um, many of us went through a lot of challenges and difficulties this year. Some of us had great blessings, and so, Father, we just recognize both of those things, that um, in the blessings that all good things come from you, and also in those challenges that we're here. So that means you've provided for us and you've persevered with us. And some of us are still dealing with great challenges. And so, Father, I pray that um, those of us who are walking that out, that we would begin to take those steps into community, that we don't have to do these things alone. In fact, we shouldn't do these things alone. Um, we were made to get, gather strength in community particularly community that's surrounded by you. So Father, I also pray as we just kind of go have these conversations on these tables, I hope that people kind of get to know some more people here and connect a little bit more as well. It's in your son's name I pray, amen. All right, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and find a seat?
And um, if somebody at the table would just kind of just get it rolling. It's, again, it's not too complicated or anything like that. Just sharing who you are and just having conversations around family, church family, and how can a church become more of a family?